at Minds and Money Toronto. We're with Richard Spencer, uh, Director, President and CEO of U308, trading on the stock exchange as UWE. Thanks for joining us here. Pleasure to be here. Richard. So give us a quick overview of U308 for our audience. U308 Corp, by its name, is a uranium company, so we've got a clean energy focus there. Mm -hmm. But the other component of the, of the company is battery commodities, uh, specifically vanadium, and nickel and phosphate. You know, we're just incredibly excited about the growth that there's been in the battery commodities. We don't have lithium, we don't have uh, graphite, uh, but we feel that those fields are quite full at the moment, so it's mm -hmm. the other commodities that go into the lithium ion batteries mm -hmm. and the vanadium redox batteries that we're concentrating on. And the uranium market will eventually come back. It's low at the moment, but the battery market is the one that's exciting. Right, well, you just said that you're th you believe that the uranium prices will bounce back. How do you know? What can you share with our audience? Give <laughs> well, us some I wish insight. I, 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 wish I, was, uh, I, I wish I had that foresight, but I, I think that the, the real situation that's developing at the moment is that Kazakhstan, which produces 42% of the world's uranium, has an anti-corruption law that uh, basically means that the Kazakh producers can only sell in a transparent market, in a market where there is a, a publicly available bid price right. or an offer price. And uh, so that basically means a lot of their production goes to the spot. And so the spot, which is traditionally a small part of the uranium market, is a bit sort of swamped by that production. Mm -hmm. And what's happened with the Kazakhs is that in May, they set up a trading arm in Switzerland. Of this year? Yeah. Okay. And that trading arm will allow them to comply with the law by the producers selling to the trading arm at the spot price. Okay. And then the, spe the, the trading arm would be able to do the sales to the actual utilities under long-term contract. Okay. And that's generally done at a much higher price. Mm -hmm. And so the Kazakhs are getting the leverage in, in the total price. Mm -hmm. The trading arm was set up at the end of May and it's actually going to start actually operating right. in the next couple of weeks to months or so. So I think probably once we get past that, we'll look back on it actually starting to trade as being the trigger in the, in the uranium market. Right, so long term you're basically saying that the regulation is going to be stabilized. It will be. Okay. Um, and I think that uh, the, because the Kazakhs have produced a huge amount of uranium at very low price, mm -hmm. and now that they're trying to get that price to go up so that their margins are bigger, everyone else is going to benefit. It. But you know, I think the crucial thing for the uranium industry, and you, we, we certainly at U308 are concentrating on that, is that we can't just sit on our hands and wait for the commodity price to rise. So Richard, uh, your projects are in Argentina and Colombia. What is the jurisdiction like there? We've prioritized Argentina because the deposit is incredibly simple. It's basically just a gravel lying at surface. We scoop up the gravel and, and we basically just sieve out the, the uranium and vanadium. But the other reason that we've gone for Argentina is that it's a nuclear country. Uh, they've just signed for their, the construction of their fourth and fifth big nuclear reactors. So their aim is to produce about 20% of their electricity from nuclear. Mm -hmm. From basically a standing start, they plan to produce 20% of their electricity from wind and solar by 2020. They've got an incredible wind resource in the southern part of the country and the Atacama Desert in the northern part, which is literally the world's best uh, solar resource. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that the vanadium plays into that. Um, you know, Robert Friedland has started to speak about the vanadium redox batteries. And he's the kind of character that we need in the vanadium space for people to recognize the importance of these batteries. And you know, they, they're not sexy, they're not small, they can never be used to power your computer or your cell phone or anything like that. Let alone your car. Well, there, there's an interesting thing on the, on, on the cars, but you know, these are industrial scale, great big batteries. I mean, the Chinese are building the world's biggest battery at the moment. It's an 800 megawatt hour battery, wow. which may, means it would be able to power 200, 250,000 Chinese homes for, for a day. I, I mean, and these batteries are basically indestructible. They can be charged and discharged at the same time. They basically last for forever. Um, and in fact, when the battery uh, sort of housing eventually breaks down, you can pump that vanadium out of that battery and put it into the next thing. Nothing ever happens to that vanadium. Mm. 
Um, so, you know, the people have been put off a little bit because the capital or the entry cost is quite high. But a, um, a lithium ion battery typically lasts for about eight years or so, whereas a vanadium redox battery, they're guaranteed for 20 years and you know, generally they go for a lot longer than that. So the, the cost over time yep, is favorable. Cheaper. But you know, the, the thing is that these are massive, massive systems. Mm -hmm. So in the Argentinian situation, where you're generating wind power in the south, solar power in the north, and at different times, helping to regulate that power is going to be crucial for that grid. And the vanadium redox batteries, along with pumped hydro and a couple mm -hmm. of other things, are going to be the way to, to do it. Let's talk about um, peers in, the, in, in this area. So what is the differentiating factor for U308? We are the only company in Argentina that has a 43101 resource as well as an economic study. So we know what our capital costs are, we know um, what our production cost okay. is. And you know, earlier I mentioned that it's, it's crucial for the industry to be fighting to lower its costs. And having done that economic study, it's pinpointed some areas where we've got an unexpectedly high cost or whatever through something that we hadn't really thought about. Okay. Um, and now, having done that study, we know where those sort of anomalous points are. And are you working on lowering those costs? Absolutely. Okay. Um, there are a couple of ways that we can lower those costs. Okay. And in fact, our objective is to lower our production costs to uh, be competitive with the, the Kazakhstan companies, which are the lowest cost in, in the world. With vanadium, vanadium is a byproduct. Um, there's only one mine in Brazil where it's the primary product. Every, everywhere else it depends on the steel industry, so if the steel industry is in the doldrums then the, the vanadium supply drops right. off. The vanadium market went into deficit last year and finally the prices started to react and, and, and move to the upside. The really exciting thing about the vanadium market is that not only is the, the use of vanadium in steel growing, mm -hmm. um, steel's growing at about 3 to 4 percent a year, but on top of that the uh, vanadium required for both lithium ion batteries and vanadium redox batteries is starting to grow exponentially. So by 2020, right. about a quarter of the vanadium demand is going to mm -hmm. be from the battery industry. So, Great. you know, things are really, really exciting. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your insights today with us, Richard. Thanks very much for having me.